In the previous episode, we built an operational amplifier using 6686 vacuum tubes, and it was terrible. It was a horrible operational amplifier, but it was an operational amplifier and it worked, which means that we could use that to build what I'm ultimately wanting to build, which is the clock for our vacuum tube computer. Now, our clock has some pretty interesting requirements, which I'll get into a little bit later, uh, but this Operational amplifier would work, but I just I can't leave well enough alone and I after I made that video I, I sat around thinking that there was a lot of performance and capability just left on the table And so that's what I want to do today I want to take a look at potentially enhancing the performance of that operational amplifier so that it performs much more closely to a real operational amplifier and we're going to do that actually by reeling our knowledge all the way back to the very beginning because I think there might be a fundamental flaw in how we're building our inverters, which is what we're using as the, the basis for everything that we build. So this episode I'm going to split into two parts. We're going to have the first part where we take a look at the inverters and maybe do some testing and try to figure out the best inverter design. And then the second part is going to be we're digging into that operational amplifier and building a better version of it. Uh, and instead of making you guys wait a whole week for the second part to come out, I'm going to release the second part tomorrow. So uh, they're going to go back to back, which is... Fantastic, and that'll be a lot of fun. But first, we gotta hop over to the bench, take a look at our inverters, and see how we can improve them to hopefully ultimately improve the performance of our op amp. So let's hop over there and get started. So this is our basic inverter, and this is essentially the fundamental building block that we've been using to create almost every single circuit that we've built up to now. And you can see I've drawn it here as a triode, but this could really be a, a triode, a tetrode, a pentode, a heptode, pretty much whatever you can get your hands on. And it's laid out really simply. You can see that we have a resistor coming into the plate, and then the output is pulled off of the plate as well. And then we have a current limiting resistor for the grid, and then we have two resistors set up as a voltage divider to essentially bring the input down to a level that the grid is expecting. And so the grid ultimately controls the amount of electron flow through the tube. So if the grid is completely negative, there's no electron flow through the tube at all, which means that our output gets pulled up to the same level as our B plus voltage, which in this case is 24 volts. Now when the tube starts conducting and it goes into full saturation, that is as many electrons are flowing as is possible, the output's going to be pulled low. And this act of pulling the output high and low is how we're getting our logic high and logic low that we're using in all of our circuits that we've built up to now. So the more I thought about this and the more I thought about the plate resistor and how the vacuum tube actually operates, the more I started to realize, and I, I don't know why I didn't realize this sooner, but the vacuum tube itself actually kind of operates as a giant variable resistor or potentiometer just like this. We can kind of think of the plate as coming into the center pin, and then we have one pin going to ground, and well, the other pin stays floating. And then the position of that center pin can change based upon the input voltage, which is, you know, coming into the grid. So if we move that all the way up to here, we get the maximum amount of resistance. And if we move it all the way down to here, we get the minimum amount of resistance. And so the, the vacuum tube is essentially that, because if it is in full saturation, that means a maximum amount of electrons flowing from the cathode to the plate here, that's the same as having a very small resistance. Or if it is in full cutoff, which means that the grid has a sufficiently negative charge to prevent any electrons from flowing, that's like you know moving the center pin of the potentiometer all the way up to max here and having the maximum amount of resistance. Except that most potentiometers can go all the way to zero, and a vacuum tube is always going to have some internal resistance in it, even if it's in full saturation. So we won't quite go to zero. And most potentiometers don't have the massive amount of essentially internal resistance that a vacuum tube has when it's in cutoff. So we kind of end up with a variable resistor that can go from something like, say, uh, I don't know, about 3000 ohms all the way up to 100 mega ohms or something incredibly massive like that. 
And so when it's at 100 mega ohms, it's essentially cut off. And that means that the output here is going to be pulled up to 24 volts. But when you're in full saturation and we come right on down to about 3000 ohms, well, that's interesting because now we just have a voltage divider. And so 3000 ohms down here. And if we have a 10,000 ohm plate resistor, that gives us a output value here of about, uh, I think, five and a half volts. And so the internal resistance of the tube is kind of what is limiting our output from coming any lower. Now, a, a 24 volt to five and a half volt swing is, is fantastic. That's a, a massive amount of voltage swing, but I think we can do better. And because the grid of a vacuum tube is incredibly high impedance, we don't actually need all that much current coming out of our output here. So we can actually crank this plate resistor value right on up. And so if we take a look at cranking this up to say 33,000 ohms, if we have 33,000 ohms here and 3,000 ohms here, that means our output's gonna come all the way down to like two volts. That's awesome. All right, but that also means that when the tube goes into full cutoff, we still go up to 24 volts. That is epic. Now, of course, that means that we're going to have to increase the values of the divider network here for the grid because this output often feeds into another inverter. So this output will go into the input of another one. And we have negative 12 volts here. So if these values are too small, there's not enough current here and that's just gonna pull that value down and nothing's gonna happen. So we need to crank these right on up as well. And I was using 22,000 ohms and 33,000 ohms here but I think we're gonna push that all the way up to uh, probably about 220,000 ohms because I have a lot of those hanging about. So before we go any further, let's pop a breadboard out and just give this a quick shot and see what the result is. All right, so we've got a really basic setup here. We've got a 6AU6 pentode here, which means that we have a 100 ohm uh, screen grid resistor right here. Uh, but other than that, it's set up pretty similarly to how a triode would be set up. This is currently set up in our old style. We have a 10,000 ohm resistor here, and then we have a 22,000 ohm resistor for input and a 33,000 ohm resistor to negative 12 volts right here. And right now, the 22,000 ohm resistor is going through a push button, which isn't being pushed. So the 33,000 ohm resistor is pulling the grid to negative, which means that our output is going to be high. So you can see that we were reading 24.2 volts here. Now, if I push this button, what that should do is pull the grid high enough that the tube goes into saturation, which means that we should see an internal resistance of about uh, 3,000 3, ohms or so. And a 10,000 ohm, 3,000 ohm voltage divider should give us about five and a half volts. So let's push that button and see what happens. <laughs> yeah. yeah, look at that. I actually didn't expect it to be pretty much exactly five and a half volts. <laughs> Um, so I guess that means that the internal resistance of the 6AU6 when in full saturation at 24 volts is pretty much 3000 ohms. That's awesome. All right, so next let's change out our plate resistor with a 33,000 ohm resistor. And let's also change out our voltage divider network uh, input resistor here with uh, two 20,000 ohm resistors. So let's change that right quick. All right, so now we have the 33,000 ohm resistor in on the plate, and then we have a 220,000 ohm resistor coming into the push button and a 220,000 ohm resistor pulling the grid to negative 12 volts. And right now the push button isn't pushed, so our output's gonna be high and that's 24.2 volts. That's exactly the same as the 10,000 ohm resistor. We weren't expecting any different. Uh, but I want to see what happens when I push that button because 33,000 ohms and 3,000 ohms as a voltage divider is two volts. So hopefully we'll see something like two volts on our output here. Let's give that a shot. Yeah, it's, look at that. It's actually a little less than two volts. We're down to 1.7 volts. So the internal resistance of a vacuum tube is obviously a, a very dynamic aspect of it. Um, but you can see it's still right around 3000 ohms. Uh, that's, man, that's so cool. 24 volts to 1.7 volts. Talk about a serious voltage swing. <laughs> All right, I, 
I am in incredibly happy with how that turned out. But just testing a single inverter is not exactly the best way to figure out how our new plate resistor and divider network resistors over here are going to react in real world situations. Because as I said before, oftentimes the output feeds into the input of another one. So we won't have a really strong button input coming into here. So we need to essentially build something that has two inverters in it and they constantly feed into each other. Well, it just so happens that that's pretty easy to build. And this is an SR flip-flop. And so you can see essentially we have two tubes set up as inverters and the output of one feeds into the input of the other and vice versa. And then we have our additional set and reset you know, pins coming in. And we can actually just set this up as a bi-stable multi-vibrator, which you can see here. Now this one still has the old values written on it, 10,000 ohms here and here, and then 22 and 33 here and here. But what we're going to do is we're going to replace those with 33,000 ohm for the plate resistor, and then 220,000 ohm for our resistor divider network. But I want to get a proper comparison. So we'll try it with 10,000 ohms on the plate resistor first, and then we'll bump up to our proper 33,000 ohms and go from there. But as I mentioned earlier, the internal resistance of the tube is going to change how effective our voltage divider network is and each tube is going to have slightly different internal resistance. So I would really love to maybe swap these tubes out. We'll start with the 6AU6, but I wanna test a bunch of different tubes in this SR flip-flop design. I'm gonna test both pentodes and triodes, and we're gonna test them all at 33,000 ohms. So we'll start with the 10,000 ohm on the 6AU6, then we'll bump up to the 33,000 ohm on the 6AU6, and then We'll go hog wild and just test a bunch of different tubes and take a look at the results at the end and see how all these different tubes perform when set up as a bi-stable multi-vibrator SR flip-flop. All right, so I've got two 6AU6 pentodes set up here as a bi-stable multi-vibrator. And this is set up with our old resistor values. So we have 10,000 ohm plate resistor, 22,000 ohm input resistor, and then 33,000 ohm resistor going to negative 12 volts as the bias. And I've got two push buttons here set up for set and reset. And you can see that I'm checking the value off of this plate resistor, and it's at 17.1 volts. So this is what we're seeing from that 33,000 ohm, 22,000 ohm resistor network pulling the output down. So our resistor values there aren't big enough. We need something bigger than 22,000 and 33,000 ohms. But if we go bigger than that, the, the balance gets all wrong. So 22,000 and 33,000 were the best balance I could find while sticking with a 10,000 ohm plate resistor. And so when set up in our SR flip-flop, you can see that we have a, a set value of 17.1 volts and then a reset value of 5.5 volts. So we, we pretty much pull the tube into saturation, but when it's in cutoff, we don't have as high of a value on the output as we would hope. And so hopefully when we change over to a 33,000 ohm with uh, 220,000 ohm resistors used for our bias network, we can get both a higher set value and a lower reset value. So a higher on and a lower off. That's our goal. So let's pop in the 33,000 ohm plate resistor and change out our divider network resistors and see what happens. And you can see right off the bat that our set value, our high value is much larger. We were getting like 17 volts before, now we're at 21 volts. So that's a massive increase. So that's already a huge win in my book. That's awesome. But let's see what our low value is when the tube goes into saturation. Because before we were getting about five and a half volts. So hopefully we'll get something a little lower this time. Let's give it a shot. Yes. Oh, that's ridiculous. Look at that. 2.2 volts, 2.1 volts. So we're getting a 21 volt to two volt swing. That is unbelievable for a set reset latch. What a massive improvement. Oh man, I am so, so happy with this. 
Uh, now, I am definitely going to use the 6AU6 tube for most everything, but I'm curious. I have a bunch of other tubes. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to keep this same basic SR multivibrator setup, and I'm going to record the set and the reset value off of the, the rightmost tube here for each one of those tubes and see just how each tube performs. And then we'll take a look at the results, and hopefully we'll see something interesting. All right, and here's the results. And there's some like massive surprises in here. So first of all, the nine pin dual triode tubes gave me a bit of problem. I couldn't get them to switch with a 33,000 ohm on the plate and 220, 220 for the bias. So instead I bumped it up to 100,000 on the plate and 330, 330 for the bias. And I was able to get most of them to switch, but that meant that the maximum voltage when it's you know essentially on was essentially limited to 18 and a half volts and i think this is because we were just running such a massive plate resistor but i was able to get most of them to switch and they did relatively well i mean obviously the 7308 which is a highly specialized tube a very very expensive tube uh, it even has gold pins on it which is kind of wild uh, but it did the best and gave a voltage swing of about 17 and a half volts from uh you know, from on to off. And so that's, that's actually really pretty good. But the big surprises all came from the pentodes. So the 6AU6 was essentially my benchmark. And I didn't think anything was really going to be able to beat the 6AU6, but there were actually four tubes that outperformed the 6AU6. I'm just blown away by that. So the, the 6BK5 and the 6CL6 were both phenomenal tubes. They were 21.1 volts to 0 0.6 volts for the, the 6CL6. I mean, that's, that's insane. That's a voltage swing of 20.5 volts. That was essentially the best tube. And the 6CL6 is a power pentode, so it's got really big plates. And so that means it can move a ton of electrons, which is why we can see such a low value when the when when the SR flip-flop is essentially in reset when it when it's off. That's crazy. 21.1 volts to zero points. That's that just blows my mind. But not as much as the 6AS5, which is a heptal tube. It's a seven-pin tube. But again, it's a really tall tube with really big plates, so it can move a ton of electrons. Now it didn't have as high of a uh, voltage when it was in set, but the 6AS5 came all the way down to 0 0.1 volts. This is insane. That's essentially ground. Unbelievable. If if I had the choice, I would build everything out of the 6AS5s, but uh, unfortunately I've already bought hundreds and hundreds of the 6AS6 tubes. So this was a really, really interesting test. I think what this goes to show is that by tweaking the plate resistor along with the bias resistors and the balance between them, you can really get just about any tube that you get your hands on to do what you want it to do. So this was really, really insightful. I'm so glad I went through and tested this, but also I think that this can be fantastic information for any of you guys out there building your own tube circuits. And if you are building tube circuits, definitely let me know. Either join us in the Discord or leave a comment below and I will definitely read it. At any rate, we're armed with some really good information about how to build our inverters. And so in the second part, which is coming out tomorrow, we'll take that information and we'll apply it to the operational amplifier that we built and see how it goes from there. So thank you guys so much for watching and I'll see you tomorrow.